uh, welcome to panel one. My name is David G. Schuster and I shall be your moderator for this panel. Panel one is entitled, Make Love or War, America and the World in the 1960s and 70s. And for this panel, we have four fascinating papers. The first paper is, is gonna be presented by Hannah Smith. It's entitled, um, The Making of a Long Strange Trip, LSD and the Grateful Dead. The second paper is gonna be by Holly Holland. Uh, on a similar topic from the Bay Area. This paper is going to be entitled Defining Hippies from Heads to Tails, Haight-Ashbury and the Summer of Love. The third paper is going to, is going to be presented by Amara Scheitlin and her paper is entitled Culture and Politics, Personal Connections and Ping Pong Diplomacy. This is the diplomacy in the early 1970s between United, well, I'll let her talk about it. <laughs> And then the final paper is going to be uh, presented by Sam Lyon. Uh, it's entitled An Alliance of Dysfunction, another foreign policy paper. This one between United States and, uh, um, well, I'll let him talk about that as well. So to begin with, I'm going to turn the, uh, the, the, the platform over to Hannah Smith and her paper entitled The Making of a Long Strange Trip, LSD and the Grateful Dead. The Making of a Long Strange Trip, LSD and the Grateful Dead. LSD, a hallucinogenic drug first discovered by accident in 1938, would prove to be a staple of the counterculture's music scene in the 1960s. The Grateful Dead, a rock band with roots in California, was one of the bands perhaps most associated with the counterculture on the West Coast. Beginning their career as the Warlocks, the Grateful Dead came into their own at writer Ken Kesey's and the Merry Prankster's acid test parties in the 1960s. Ever present through their journey was the use of psychedelic drugs such as LSD. The acid test parties and LSD impacted the culture of the Grateful Dead for three decades by creating their unique sound, a psychedelic aesthetic, a connection to their fans, and a community amongst the fans that all culminated to give the band a legacy that held true for many decades. While acid rock is not unique to the Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Blue Cheer, and the Flamin' Groobies, among others, also represented the sound, it began with the dead at the acid tests. The term acid rock came out of the tests. Tom Wolfe claimed in the electric Kool-Aid acid tests that since the tests, the dead were the pioneers of a new sound, and that's when the, began, the band became a thing. The, um, indeed, Jerry Garcia claimed in 1988 that the acid tests were the most important six months for his band. For the first couple dig, gigs before the test, Garcia claimed that the band sounded really awful. But as he proclaimed in an interview for Rolling Stone, being high allowed him to improvise cosmically and every note and every silence became a whole universe. At the acid test, they were able to have more fun than they had ever had ever, and they were able to relax and find their own sound. Garcia implied that the tests were where the Grateful Dead found what, the, what kind of band they wanted to be. Michael Benson claimed in his book, Why the Grateful Dead Matter, that there is an argument among scholars that the dead were the only ones who used LSD to its fullest potential by using it as a tool to improvise music to transform themselves into a psychedelic powerhouse. For the Grateful Dead, the use of psychedelics was an important influence on the creative process of playing music. In 1969, Garcia supported this claim that his model for playing is based on a psychedelic experience. The acid tests were vital to the creation of the Grateful Dead sound, acid rock, a term that derived from the tests. Another staple of the Grateful Dead sound that evolved out of playing on LSD was the fact that they were a jam band, a genre identified by long improvisational performances. As Garcia said in 1988, the dead had total freedom to play if we wanted to, but we could always not play at the acid tests. In fact, they did not even play in regular sets, according to Wolf, because nobody could keep time. Wolf suggested that everyone at the acid tests, including the dead, were so high that they had no sense of time, which is one effect of LSD. Being so high that they were unaware of the passage of time, the band was able to play for extended periods, enabling them to, as Bob Weir put it, play with the rhythm and texture of the music. They were able to play long and loud, as Garcia said. Bob Weir claimed in his documentary, The Other One, that doing so allowed them to extend and improvise their songs. After the test, the Warlocks became, according to Weir, for all intents and purposes, the Grateful Dead. The acid test made the dead what they were, a jam band. While LSD may have been the source of the music, the source of the LSD would prove to be every bit as profound in the band's performance and creation of their unique sound. 
Robert Greenfield explained in his novel that Owsley Stanley, a self-taught chemist and sound designer, was the one supplying the high-octane rocket fuel that powered the acid test, where he first heard the Grateful Dead perform in 1965. Hearing the dead high on acid, Stanley decided that the band was going to be bigger than the Beatles. Wolf stated that during and after the test, Stanley would come to supply the dead not only with LSD, but equipment that no rock and roll band ever had before, including the Beatles. He also designed and funded the, wall of the famous Wall of Sound, a 40-foot tall, 70-foot wide PA system that included over 600 speakers that the t band toured with for about a year. Further, Garcia was quoted saying that Stanley brought a really good consciousness of quality to the band's whole scene. LSD was responsible for Stanley's discovery of the band in 1965, which led to his investment in the Grateful Dead until 1974, when they retired the Wall of Sound. By funding instruments and designing sound equipment, Stanley's acid-fueled dreams became an integral part of the band's unique and loud sound. Long and Loud were only half of the Grateful Dead's psychedelic equation, for the lyrics of their songs were influenced by LSD as well. Robert Hunter, the Dead's lyricist, was the first member of the band to use LSD in the 1950s, later recommending it to the rest of the band. Hunter claimed in an interview for Rolling Stone that the first time Jerry Garcia took acid, he came over to Hunter's house and asked him what he should do, to which Hunter said to put on a record and listen to the music. In an interview with David Gans for his novel, Conversations with the Dead, Hunter tells the story of how he came to write China Cat Sunflower, one of the band's performance staples, while in a hypersensitive state hallucinating cats marching across a rainbow to Neptune. Hunter created the lyrics for one of the Grateful Dead's most popular songs based on an acid trip, and he was not the only one. In the other one, Bob Weir tells a story about being high on acid after seeing the Beatles and walking onto the Merry Pranksters bus. The story sounds remarkably similar to the lyrics he wrote for the song The Other One, which include, the bus came by and I got on, that's when it all began. There was Cowboy Neil at the wheel of the bus to Never Ever Land. The bus is that of the Merry Pranksters, and Cowboy Neil refers to Neil Cassidy, who drove the bus. The Other One is another popular dead song, and its lyrics are a direct reference to an acid trip. Both Hunter and Weir were inspired by acid trips to create lyrics to the Grateful Dead songs, aiding in the creation of a unique sound for the band. Further, the psychedelic nature of the dead sound culminated into a unique aesthetic to the band. The cultural impact of the Grateful Dead pushed beyond the boundaries of the music to include an entire genre of psychedelic art affirmed by psychedelic band logos, album art, posters, clothing, and other merchandise, all influenced by the visual cues created by LSD. The two people still most known for their contribution to the Dead's artwork were Alison Kelly and Stanley Mouse, who were described as one of the most memorable aestheticians. Kelly and Mouse created the visuals most widely correlated with the band, including the Dancing Bears, Skull and Roses, and the various psychedelic album art and posters that appeared over the years. When asked if there was any psychedelic influence in their work, Mouse replied that, while it was difficult, especially when the paper starts talking back to you, he had done many posters while tripping on LSD. In 1997, he claimed that when acid came on the scene, it blew everything apart, and that it started with the psychedelics. The Grateful Dead's famous Skull and Roses can be categorized as psychedelic art, too, for Mouse said that nature is more psychedelic than anything created by man. While Mouse and Kelly were known for the Skull and Roses, Dancing Bears, and posters and album art, Bob Thomas was the one who drew one of the most well-known trademarks in the history of rock, the Steal Your Face logo. How he got, however, he got the idea from Owsley Stanley, LSD guru, who decided after taking too many things that the band needed a way to mark their equipment from the other bands at festivals. These icons were used by, the dead, by deadheads to produce shirts, posters, blotter acid, and other things, thus tying the band closer to its fans. From logos to posters, the Grateful Dead's aesthetic was defined by psychedelics, and so too was their community of loyal fans. LSD contributed to the creation of a large shared community of the Grateful Dead's fans, deadheads. William McCown and Wendy Delaney concluded in their study of deadhead personalities that deadheads tended to be people who were more agreeable and flexible and open to experience. This is because the Dead's fan base grew out of the acid test, which were all about shared experience, including LSD use. Peter Connors claims in his memoir about being a teenage deadhead during the 80s, growing up dead, that in the cultural importance of the band, the acid tests were a powerful touchstone. According to Connors, since the very beginning, there was a common thread that was the cornerstone of the deadhead community. 
psychedelics, and the music. He went on to say that for Deadheads, when there were potentialities of mixing hallucinogens in music, the 1965 and 1966 acid tests never really ceased at all. Connors implied that it was this experience of tripping and listening to music that brought the Deadhead community together, even after over 20 years. Jason Smith, a veteran Deadhead, agreed with Connors when he stated that he would go to shows all over the country and find others that he had made a connection with at a different show, and that connection was always getting high. Indeed, Jerry Garcia's second wife, Carolyn Adams Garcia, or as she was better known, Mountain Girl, said in an interview for the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies that one purpose of taking psychedelics was to create a festive atmosphere with a community that had each other to fall back on. Deadheads were largely based around their experience on LSD, creating a community that shared a love for the music. LSD did not only allow Deadheads to share connections with each other, but to the band and their music as well. Peter Connors described how at one Grateful Dead show, the band hijacked his trip because he was so lost in the reverie of the music that no self-consciousness had space to survive. In this way, the LSD allowed Connors to feel an immense connection between himself and the Dead's music. The ego dissolution that comes from ingesting LSD allowed Connors to think outside of himself and focus on the music. For Jason Smith, the parts of the music that were the easiest to focus on when the band would begin, the more improvisational and experimental aspects of the song are set. According to Smith, it was through psychedelics that Deadheads were able to be absolutely enraptured by these parts of the shows. He claimed this was evident at a number of shows because after a few minutes of this, all the people not tripping would finally wander out to get a beer, leaving the rest of us to listen to the music. Smith means to say that psychedelics were directly responsible for linking Deadheads to the music, as the audience reaction was different for those who were not high during parts of the show that were unique to the Dead sound. LSD created a neural link between the Deadheads and the Dead. These narratives help to conclude that the acid tests of the mid-1960s and the widespread use of LSD had a profound impact on the development of the Grateful Dead by influencing their musical growth into an improvisational, long-form acid rock band, creating, via those acid tests of the early days, a sustainable community of deadheads and a clear and unbreakable bond between the community and the band itself. Stretching beyond the band and its followers, the dead helped to create a psychedelic aesthetic in terms of album covers, logos, posters, and other works of art that endured for over half a century. While the acid tests were a starting point for the band, influenced their music in the 60s, by the 70s, LSD influenced their label and aesthetic, and dropping acid influenced their fans in the 80s. As the Grateful Dead evolved as a band, so did the influence of LSD on their culture. Because of the influence that LSD brought to bear on both the band and its adherents, it is easy to see that without psychedelic drugs, this long, strange trip might never have begun. Thank you very much, Hannah. Now, we will, we will have questions at the end after all the papers have been presented. So we're gonna go right into the next paper. This one's by Holly Holland, and it's entitled, Defining Hippies from Heads to Tails. <laughs> I love titles. State Ashbury and the Summer of Love. Well, hi, guys. <laughs> okay. Um, so as my paper title suggests, I'm going to be talking about hippies and what it means to be a hippie, um, particularly in the Haight-Ashbury district of San, San Francisco. Um, the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco served as a microscope into the hippie countercultures and perceptions of 1967. Like any counterculture, the hippie counterculture of Haight-Ashbury was defined by not only its neighbors, but also through divisions within the counterculture itself. Through my research, I found two divisions within the counterculture, one division involving drugs and the other involving age and political affinity. Um, through my research, I also found that beyond the surface philosophy of free love and peace, there was a lack of cohesion in dogma and a philosophy of the hippie counterculture as well. This effectively created an environment where dealing um, where defining what it means to be a hippie was subject to individual notions rather than a collective conscious. With the different defining perceptions of the Haight-Ashbury counterculture, there can be seen a correlation between the definers of the counterculture and the evolution of the Haight-Ashbury district 
and ultimately the metamorphosis of the hippie experiment into mainstream society. This evolution into mainstream society can be evidenced by its commercialization. So, one division within the movement itself is through drug choice. The underbelly of the Haight-Ashbury counterculture defined itself as a counterculture symbiotic with drug culture, primarily marijuana and LSD from its inception and notable hippies such as uh, Ken Kenzie and Timothy Leary, those are holdovers from the beatnik generation. This symbiotic relationship would eventually endanger the counterculture as further division within the culture became highlighted through drug choice. I just have photos. <laughs> While some hippies felt that the Haight-Ashbury and the countercultural hippie experiment was based on free love, others argued it was centered around drugs and drug culture. This was especially true for those involved in the drug trade in Haight-Ashbury, as self-proclaimed hippie and drug dealer named Teddy Bear explained that truthfully this community is based on dope, not love, in a Washington Post article written by Nicholas Von Hoffman. However, the hippie counterculture relied on drugs for self-expression, self reflection, and insight to lead better lives. In the counterculture, it was rel relatively understood that drugs such as marijuana, LSD, or acid were used as a meditative tool to be used. However, as the counterculture expanded, there emerged a division among those who used drugs for meditative uses and those who used it for medicative purposes. Counterculturalists who used drugs for medi meditative purposes were considered heads, while those who used drugs for medicative purposes were considered freaks. <laughs> this internal division within a counterculture between heads and freaks can be exemplified by reconstructing the drug scene in Haight-Ashbury and its major players in 1967. So there are three players involved in the drug scene in Haight-Ashbury and its counterculture. Teddy Bear, previously mentioned, a drug dealer focused in grass and acid, that would be marijuana and LSD, Super Spade, another drug dealer, and Chocolate George, who I think is my favorite, um, <laughs> a Hell's Angels member, friend and muscle for the dealers in the hippie counterculture. As the counterculture scene grew in Haight-Ashbury, so did the drug scene. Teddy Bear, Super Spade, and Chocolate George were there to ensure their customers had their fill. However, with the influx of hippies in the drug scene, too difficult to manage with burns happening. That's when uh, violent consequences of drugs received that were not quite as advertised, if you catch my drift. Um, Super, State, Super Spade, Teddy Bear, and Chocolate George sought to form an alliance of all the righteous dealers who only sell righteous stuff. The implication of developing an alliance with, between dealers and its customers is emblematic of the severity of the divide in the counterculture between heads and freaks. If the division between heads and freaks were not problematic for the counterculture itself, then the violence associated with Burns and freaks sure indicated a deeper division and ideology associated with drugs in the counterculture. For heads, drugs were viewed as, as a mystic tool in order to develop a deeper understanding of oneself and the world in which they find themselves. This introspective undertaking by its nature coincides nicely with the free love, harm no one founding ideology of the counterculture itself. However, for freaks, drugs were pursued on a personal level the, and one that directly contradicts the founding ideology of the counterculture experiment. The pursuit of drugs for personal gain, even due to addiction, often led to violence, which was a violation of the counterculture's ideology of no harm. Yeah. Um, these were often a direct result of burns in which dealers de dealt a customer um, a drug that was not advertised. So like bad weed, I guess. <laughs> With Super Spade, Teddy Bear, and Chocolate George setting up the Hate Ashbury Dealers Association to better handle burns without violent consequences, this is an example of a growing divide within a counterculture and the drug scene within it. The definers of the hippie counterculture now was inherently tied to drug choice and use. Another point that I have is there is another division within a counterculture, but it, it hinges on age and political affinity. So hippies during the summer of love was populated by run, young runaway teenagers and the media played out this divide to its full extent. Um, 
An article written by Stephen A. O. Golding for the New York Times highlights this divide as he interviews the hippies who complain that these kids are not old enough to understand the deeper philosophy of dropping out because they haven't lived in society long enough to decide if it's lousy enough. <laughs> so, so that's Chocolate George. Um, another article describes the divide between younger and older generations as having a more religious philosophy, that flowers and bells are their cross and crowns, whereas a younger generation is defined by more idealized, idealistic tendencies, described as letting one do their own thing without forcing it on another. Rather than a collective community thought of the older generations, i.e. the beatnik beatniks, this younger hippie generation focuses on their own thing or philosophy and instead of sharing this new thing with other hippies, they keep it to themselves for fear of harming the other hippies thing. So I'll do my own thing, you can do yours, we'll just keep it like that. Um, while this notion of flower children marching in an anti-war protest was very real, it was no longer agreed upon requisite to define oneself as a hippie. So being a hippie was more, I'm going to do my own thing, and that's what makes me a hippie. Um, so inherent in the division within the counterculture and with a, without a prepared collective dogma to guide the hippie counterculture is effectively left open to exploitation and commodification. This commercialization of the hippie counterculture is evidenced by the way the media portrayed hippies as a spectacle. The media played out the Haight-Ashbury counterculture as an exciting new creatures, and Haight-Ashbury was subsequently turned into a commercialized petri dish to study the county counterculture. Once the counterculture firmly planted itself in, ha in the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco after the summer of love, the bizarre clothing, strange speech, their affinity for drugs like LSD captured middle class America and their media's attention. A traveler's diary from the Los Angeles Times offered hip ideas on how to visit hippie land in the Bay Area <laughs> on July 2nd, 1967. The feature suggested visiting other cultural establishments like the drug, the drug store, spelled with an O, uh, the print mint, the blushing peony, and makes mention of a hippie hop tour that discontinued due to being hung up. The tour reference was orchestrated by the Gra uh, Grave Line Tours in 1967 and advertised as the only foreign tour within the continental limits of the U.S. With the entire Haight-Ashbury district becoming a national attraction, the hippie counterculture, with its divided dogma, fully felt the weight of mainstream commercialization. Um, with tour buses riding through the heart of hippie land to gawk at hippies, this type of spectacle also extended to journalism as well, so tourists could take a trip without swallowing the acid. <laughs> by, November, uh, by November 9th of 1967, the media continued to hound hippies for interviews even though hippies were struggling to meet with the enormous demands of interviews. Russell Baker in his article for the New York Times noted that the severe shortage of hippies and mocked the media sensation over hippies, writing that if the shortage continued, we might all have to start looking around the house for a phenomena to keep us assured that the country is in bad shape. Mm -hmm. At one point in this article, one hippie attempts to resist a newspaper interview interviewer from Ferrant, while another urges the former to shape up and remember you're a hippie, try to act like one. <laughs> <laughs> As he himself is locked in the clutches of a South Carolina socio-psychiatrist. From Baker's view, the media was so engrossed with the idea of hippies that remaining hippies left over from the summer of love who refused to go back home or school or being interviewed to near extinction. Fascinating. <laughs> Uh, Baker contends that if, a hippie, that if the hippies do not receive fr fresh replacements, they will, con they will continue to struggle to meet the nation's need for alarming situation reports. This idea that, of hippies that ba Baker is mocking is the idea that hippies are a spectacle themselves, which ironically makes those searching out this spectacle, such as interviewers, phot photographers, and scientists, into a spectacle of themselves in juxtaposition with exhausted, undernourished hippies being led away and harassed, 
Baker compares this to the spectacle of photographers fighting over a hippie at another instance, one man claiming ownership of a hippie. While hippies are defined by the idea, idea of being a spectacle, it is important to note that the sensationalization is hinged on the idea that hippies themselves and the movement aims are inherently childish and unrealistic. If hippies were viewed as adults with realistic goals and changed societal thinking, then they were not subject to sens sensationalization. From hippies defined by their love affair with drugs, and their otherworldly enticing nature, hippies started off as being defined by their beatnik predecessors. However, as the movement grew and media continued to take notice, they quickly lost the ability to define themselves. This inability to divine, define themselves led to the commercialization of hippies, an idea that the hippies themselves fought against when choosing to drop out. As Teddy Bear aptly put it in The Acid Affair, there never were any flower children, and it's you, your fault you, the mass media, did it. This wasn't the summer of love. This was the summer of bull, and you, the press, did it. Hmm. Sorry I ran over. <laughs> Thank you very much, Holly. These are great papers so far. We've got two more to go. We're going to be shifting gears a little bit and talking about foreign policy now. The next paper is by Amara Scheitlin. It's entitled, Culture and Politics, Personal Connections and Ping Pong Diplomacy. Amara. Yeah. No drugs in this one, sorry guys. <laughs> uh, as he said, I'm talking about ping pong diplomacy today and it all began in 1971 when teams gathered in Nagoya, Japan from all over the world for the 31st World Table Tennis Championships, an event that inadvertently paved the way for the slow development of diplomatic relations between the United States and the People's Republic of China. In the years soon after so-called ping pong diplomacy, formal political relations remained incomplete between the two countries, but tensions did begin to thaw and the US and China experienced many exchanges. Ping pong diplomacy did not just occur at the state level, however, it also happened on a personal level. Interactions between the American and Chinese teams eventually caused political discussions to emerge between diplomatic leaders in, in the US and China. Moreover, individuals such as athletes, government officials, businessmen, and academics all helped tensions to thaw and American perceptions to change, allowing for political and cultural exchanges to occur between the U.S. and China in the 1970s and eventual rapprochement. As previously stated, the personal connections that developed through ping pong diplomacy began with the World Table Ch Tennis Championships in 1971. An American player named Glenn Cowan initiated the first move towards relations with China by asking a Chinese competitor to practice with him before his match. He then missed his bus to the competition. Uh, so to avoid arriving late, Cowan caught a ride on the Chinese team's bus and he immediately encountered a lack of hospitality and communication. Um, however, there was one Chinese champion named Zhu Wang who welcomed the American player and he even gifted him a silk art piece which Cowan later reciprocated in the most American way possible with a red, white, and blue tie-dye t-shirt <laughs> emblazoned with a peace symbol and, and words from the Beatles song, Let It Be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this initial interaction between two ping pong players is what first sparked personal connections between the Chinese and Americans, and it convinced Chairman Mao to invite the U.S. team to visit China on April 15th. The U.S. team's captain, Graham Steenhoven, accepted this invitation many months later, and many months later, members of China's ping pong team, alongside some government officials, came together and visited the United States. After the U.S. team's visit to China in 1971, government officials in both the United States and China followed their model of person-to-person -person relations as a means to open the door to diplomacy. Nixon had previously expressed a desire to pursue a new policy with China. He had already begun progressively lifting trade restrictions and travel restrictions, and unlike Lyndon B. Johnson, he was not discouraged by the Vietnam War. Chairman Mao also expressed a desire for rapprochement, but the U.S. and China did not become friends overnight, as shocking as that may sound. Prior to any visit, there is immense preparation on both sides. Kissinger traveled to Beijing before Nixon, where he met with a special task force headed by Zhou Enlai, 
Joe played a key role in Kissinger's visit and partook in negotiations for Nixon's following trip. He and Kissinger came to the meeting in Beijing in July of 1971 to discuss topics from the Mao Nixon summit to Taiwan, Vietnam, relations with the Soviet Union, and arms control. But Taiwan and Vietnam were two of the main topics at hand. Unfortunately, these issues highlighted disparities between the United States and China in terms of policies. Joe really pushed the Taiwan issue, but Kissinger mostly dodged his questions and he didn't make any promises to recognize China over Taiwan. As for Vietnam, Joe wanted no part in peace negotiations and Nixon's expansion of the war into, into Cambodia and Laos only worsened China's view of the United States' involvement in Asia. Kissinger tried to connect the conflict in Vietnam to the U.S.'s relationship with Beijing, but Joe remained steadfast on his support for the North Vietnamese, and he refused to help the U.S. pressure Hanoi. Despite these differences, Kissinger and Joe established a communique in Shanghai in 1972 that consisted of both the U.S. and China's positions on the issues of Vietnam and Taiwan, and both agreed not to seek hegemony in the Asia-Pacific region. Thus, U.S. Sino political relations were not yet normalized in the early 1970s, but the budding personal relationship between Joe and Kissinger marked a breakthrough in diplomacy between their countries. This breakthrough set an example for some other countries to try and replicate. For example, in 1972, Japan sought to improve its own relations with China through sport diplomacy, except it used volleyball instead of ping pong. And in Thailand, the government sent a ping pong team to China in hopes of encouraging similar diplomatic relations. But the personal connections developed through ping pong diplomacy were not strictly political. They also spilled over into the public sphere. Following the U.S. team's visit to China in 1971, there was an increased interest in China that led to the expansion of invitations from things like the U.S. Open Tennis Championship all the way to the Miss Universe contest. There is also evidence of some change in American perceptions regarding China. For example, American journalist John Roderick reported on his stay in Shanghai in November of 1972. He claimed that there was some more openness to discussing politics among the Chinese and an increase in self-confidence because, quote, the Americans, Japanese, and other foreigners had been met and found to be no better nor any worse than they, end quote. Although Roderick's article contained bias, it reflected the psychological effect that ping pong diplomacy could have. He claimed that the Chinese were more open, but in a way he had become more open himself. For Roderick, U.S. Sino relations shifted his attitude, not about China and communism as a whole, but rather about the Chinese people themselves. Americans developed personal connections to China in other ways, like through art. Before ping pong diplomacy, many aspects of Chinese art were widely regarded as propagandistic. To non-communist countries, the vast portraits devoted to Chairman Mao could be a little bit unnerving. But in the 1970s, Chinese art began to be seen as something other than mere communist propaganda, and a new appreciation emerged. American journalist Joan Liebold Cohen suggested examining China's art as people's art, created by the masses and representative of Chinese culture. This new appreciation for Chinese art was exemplified farther by organizations such as the Pacific Culture Foundation. The aim of its par art program was to create cultural understanding between the West and Asia through instruction on things like Chinese brush painting, Japanese printmaking, and Indian kites. This program encouraged Americans of both Asian and European descent to explore art and culture together. Although China was a communist state, the people of China and their art did not have to be defined as communist propaganda. Personal connections also created cultural exchanges in the realm of business and marketing. Ping pong itself became more popular in the years following ping pong diplomacy. This provided an opportunity for entrepreneurs to really work the market. For example, Glenn Cowan himself capitalized on the cultural impact of ping pong diplomacy by forming a company called Youth Marketing Incorporated that marketed China-made ping pong paddles. Other businesses, such as the China Trade, a trade Association, marketed China-made carpets and bicycles, which were popular just because they were made in China. Uh, panda bears were another cultural fad in the 1970s. Due in part to the previous ban on trade with China, a panda bear had not been in the United States since 1953. But in 1972, the United States was given two pandas named Zing Zing and Ling Ling. Because of these new pandas that went to the Washington Zoo, panda-based toys were in high demand. Some businesses, such as Rumpelmeyer Restaurant, completely sold out of pandas and had to order more to meet the demands of customers. And according to Herbert Rafe of Gun Manufacturing, pandas had high buyer acceptance at the Toys Fair in March of 1972. Furthermore, scholars and students in the United States and China developed their own personal connections and ignited intellectual exchange. 
In the U.S., China courses, Chinese courses gain momentum among college students. In 1972, the number of students taking introductory Chinese doubled at UCLA, it tripled at the University of Pennsylvania, and it quadrupled at the University of Wisconsin. Professors across the nation were forced to drop classes due to overcrowding or find bigger rooms to fit all the students. Some professors feared it was just a fad and that there was no deep, ro deeply rooted desire to delve into Chinese studies. Still, these intellectual interchanges occurred at the individual level and were further exemplified in some more complex exchanges occurring between the U.S. and China. The Committee on Scholarly Communication with the People's Republic of China, or the CSCPRC, and the National Committee on United States-China China Relations, or the NCUSCR, both formed in 1966 with the goal to encourage scholarly interchange with China. In 1975, the CSCPRC landed 15 scholarly trips to China, while the NCUSCR had six larger exchanges. China did not reciprocate a majority of the United States visits, but some were accomplished through other private organizations, such as the American Society of Newspaper Editors. In conclusion, ping pong diplomacy impacted U.S. Sino relations in the 1970s and set many exchanges in motion capitalizing, by capitalizing on the development of personal connections between the U.S. and China. Although formal diplomatic relations were not declared in the immediate aftermath of ping pong diplomacy, other political relations were enhanced. Government, of, government officials from the U.S. and China were able to meet in person and discuss some of the key issues regarding U.S. and China, regarding U.S. Sino relations at the time, particularly Taiwan and Vietnam. The rapprochement that occurred between China and the United States also emboldened other countries to pursue personal connections, shaping the course of international politics. Cultural exchanges also flourished in the 1970s due to ping pong diplomacy. In the U.S., there was a rise in popularity for panda bears, people's art, and ping pong itself. In addition, traveling organizations opened the door to academic interchange between the U.S. and China, although it was mostly one way. Thus, ping pong diplomacy encouraged the creation of personal connections between individuals in the United States and China, which paved the way for political and cultural exchanges and changed the course of U.S. Sino relations. Thank you very much, Amara. Our last paper, paper on the panels is going to be by Sam Lyon. It is entitled, An Alliance of Dysfunction. So in America, the word Vietnam is often used in the context of a variety of questions. Primarily, why did Vietnam go so wrong? Um, so it's extremely important to attempt to answer this question, as it's very closely linked to American identity. Um, my paper aims to approach this question in a unique way. I will focus on the United States military political structure and its dealings with the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, or the ARVN. It's an important acronym, remember it. <laughs> um, I'll prove that the U.S. ARVN relationship was truly an alliance of dysfunction. It was a tightly woven and toxic system of interdependency which crippled the operational effectiveness of both armies. In order to analyze this dysfunction, I will closely examine both the history of this dependency and just how the United States and the ARVN operated both individually and in concert. So, imperialism knocked on Vietnam's door in 1858 with the French invasion of Da Nang. French control peaked in 1884 with its complete imposition in Vietnam. The Franco-Vietnamese relationship was always turbulent, and after World War II, the Viet Minh actually looked to America to support them in their struggle for an independent state, going so far as to actually cite the American Declaration of Independence during their own Festival of Independence. Uh, this was not absurd, actually, as the United States had, after all, begun their long-lasting relations with Vietnam by helping them oust the Japanese. The hope that Ho Chi Minh, the leader of Vietnam then and North Vietnam later, had for American support was completely unfulfilled as America supported the French recolonization attempt. After the defeat of France, the Geneva Conference split Vietnam along the 17th parallel into the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the DRV, in the north, and the Republic of Vietnam, the RVN, in the south. Following the Geneva Conference's division of Vietnam, the United States poured resources into the Arvin. These resources were most observable as wealth, technology, and manpower. Early assistance came in the form of 1,500 U.S. advisors who advised South Vietnam on minute and non-military matters. However, through Kennedy's Project Beef Up initiative, uh, monetary aid doubled from 1961 to 1962, and military advisors tripled from 3,000 to 9,000 in the same time frame. These advisors, for the most part, trained and led Arvin soldiers. They did this under the name U.S. Military Assistance Group, or MAG. 
So MAG was unanimous in wanting to shape the Arvin into a conventional type of force that could oppose a blitzkrieg similar to the one which kickstarted the Korean War. Several Arvin generals, however, insisted on maintaining small and mobile units that focused more on speed and maneuverability rather than sheer firepower. These small units would be recruited from and operate in their home locations, uh, but this was not to be as MAG leaders coerced President Diem, the leader of South Vietnam, to accept their idea or suffer fighting the North Vietnamese with no external aid. Thus, the Arvin was forced to build a military modeling that of the United States. The U.S. and Arvin ran into a severe personnel dilemma here uh, because in order to keep up with U.S. demand for a stronger military, the Arvin was forced to recruit more and more individuals every year. When this proved impossible, they had to institute a draft. In the 20 years of the Arvin's existence, it averaged 65% conscripts. So this highly prolific draft served as a massive agent of dysfunction in the U.S. Arvin alliance. It illustrates how the opinions of those who were present in the field were completely cast aside for the academic theories of the U.S. Furthermore, the draft hurt South Vietnamese citizens, the nation itself, and the morale of the Arvin. The draft hurt the citizens primarily by devastating harvests. Vietnam's economy was incredibly labor-intensive, uh, which was efficient in most circumstances, but once the Arvin's draft was implemented and young South Vietnamese men were unable to tend fields, quote, many farmers lost not only their sons, but also their ability to care for their families, end quote. Exacerbating this problem, the engorged Arvin now devoured U.S. aid that could have been sent to the destitute peasants of South Vietnam. So this new conscripted military was highly dependent on the United States. And one large problem with Americanizing the Arvin was the speed and efficiency at which it was done. Uh, Arvin soldiers, who had yet to be equipped with M16s, they were promised, encountered enemies equipped with state-of-the-art Russian rifles. And this uh, cultivated a lot of animosity. Another complication in forming a massive traditional army was training. Although training experts and facilities were dreamed up by U.S. advisors in Saigon, uh, they were seldom carried out as hoped. Arvin soldiers were, quote, demoralized the minute we joined the army, end quote. Uh, no matter what new plans MAG conjured to aid in training, corrupt Arvin officials uh, always pretty much failed to implement them. This source of frustration served not only to systematically weaken the Arvin, but also to further cultivate mistrust between the two powers. Another major problem was implicit in the advisory system itself. Arvin units were typically more successful in areas where U.S. advisors were purposefully reduced, actually. And that's not altogether crazy, because for the American advisor, this is simply a one-year tour he has to complete in order to return safely home, and for the South Vietnamese officer, the stakes are far higher. He's been commissioned to fight until the war is won or lost, and he's fighting for his homeland. So you can kind of see how they would have a more aggressive edge. So the effectiveness and aggressive capabilities of the Americanized Arvin varied greatly during the course of the war. Surely extreme competence and bravery were always present in the Arvin, as many of its members fought for over 10 years to preserve their home. Lack of aggression and competence in the Arvin, therefore, stemmed less from cowardice and stupidity and more from poor leadership and training and experience and reliance on the United States. The first major Arvin encounter with the Viet Cong, or VC, is the Battle of Op Bok, which is that one. In the first days of January 1963, the Arvin, accompanied by U.S. advisors, assaulted the VC-held hamlet of Op Bok. Despite the element of surprise, outnumbering the VC 10 to 1, and having the advantage of a massive amount of technology and fire support, the Arvin actually suffered an embarrassing defeat. On top of logistical problems, and there were a lot of logistical problems, the Arvin leadership stalled or failed in vital moments during this battle, destroying the momentum that U.S. advisors had hoped to gain. Abbach paints the perfect picture of a dysfunctional alliance. Communication problems, inexperience, and awful leadership were all present in this battle for the southern hamlet. After the battle, the Arvin would enter a very slow and extremely painful growing process. Two years later, after the Arvin, stuck in their imposed western structure, continued to perform poorly and adapt slowly against the North Vietnamese Army, or NVA, U.S. Marines landed at Da Nang. After this full U.S. commitment, the United States and the Arvin conducted large search and destroy missions throughout the countryside. So this pattern of routine jungle patrols and hamlet searches was violently interrupted by an immense offensive conducted by the NVA and VC during, on the Tet Lunar New Year. So that's the Tet Offensive. It was during this cataclysmic period that the metal of the Arvin was tested, largely without United States assistance, and in most cases, actually, it was found worthy. The most notable Arvin defense occurred in the city of Hue, which is actually where that picture's pulled from. Hue was taken by surprise on January 31st, 1967, when eight battalions of NVA slipped into the city under the cover of darkness. The city was severely under strength of Arvin and U.S. forces. 
but it did not stop the Arvin from swiftly reinforcing its walled inner citadel. And despite being attacked nonstop for 12 days by a numerically superior force, the Arvin managed to stubbornly hold on to a corner of the citadel and actually gain ground here. Uh, so this provided U.S. Marines with a vital foothold with which to cross the Perfume Rizzer, Rizzer, River <laughs> in order to assist the beleaguered Arvin force. After a month of fighting, Arvin Special Forces units launched a surprise attack and took the last NVA stronghold in the city. So the Tet Offensive put in a, an enormous amount of pressure on U.S. President Lyndon Johnson and his successor, Richard Nixon. Nixon's cabinet thus began to more seriously continue negotiations in Paris with North Vietnamese delegates. Nixon decided there was only one route he could take, and he called this Vietnamization. So Vietnamization was, quote, the policy of phasing out U.S. forces and turning the war responsibilities over to the South Vietnamese, end quote. After almost 10 years of interdependency, the truth was that the American crutch was going to be pulled out of the Arvin. The new policy arrived with actually mixed feelings from the Arvin soldiers. Some in the Arvin rejoiced at the change in stratagem, as they saw it as an opportunity to fight the war on their terms. Many, however, were enraged at what they observed as an abandonment by their closest and most powerful ally. They believed that Vietnamization would change nothing about the tactics of the war and simply put all of the burden on them, which was pretty much true. <laughs> Vietnamization was viewed by Saigon as a complete betrayal. In fact, it was even more abhorrent than abandonment to them, as they postulated that the only reason they were in this spot in the first place was because, quote, Washington had set us on this course, end quote. Even the new U.S. commander of forces in Vietnam, Creighton Abrams, saw it as a flawed policy in which the Arvin was, for, or was sure to lose. After fostering an Arvin dependence on American personnel, material, and tactics for almost 10 years, the United States began to withdraw in June of 1969. Three years and many U.S. troop withdrawals later, the NVA launched the Easter Offensive. One month after this, they would hold the Arvin's most, northernmost city, Quang Tri. In response to this, Nixon said, true to his form, they have never been bombed like they're going to be bombed this time. True to his word, Operation Linebacker saw waves of B-52 bombers hitting northern targets every 45 minutes. So with this aid, the Arvin repulsed the NVA. But one thing was abundantly clear. Without the combined air power of the soon-to-vacate United States military, the Easter Offensive would have had far more dire ramifications. The question of whether or not the Arvin could operate independently would soon be answered. Six months after the Easter Offensive, a preliminary peace agreement was reached between the NVA and the U.S., and in another six months, the Paris Peace Accords would be signed in totality. This agreement mandated that the U.S. military personnel completely vacate, destroy their bases, and cease sending aid to South Vietnam in 60 days. The, Viet the, the Vietnamese peace <laughs> lasted for a short year before the NVA began seizing Arvin territory. In January of 1974, they seized Phuc Long, a province dangerously close to Saigon. A year later, the Ho Chi Minh campaign began, and three capitals were toppled in the space of a month. The NVA were tightening a noose on Saigon. Without the American air power and ordnance that they had come to rely on, no amount of Arvin competence or bravery could save the doomed army. The alliance of dysfunction finally met its dismal end when North Vietnamese tanks rolled through Saigon. The Arvin had proven themselves to be fierce and dedicated fighters in Tet, at Quang Tri, Zuan Lok, and thousands of small skirmishes in the jungles of their homeland. In the end, however, it was poor leadership, deplorable training, and a corrosive reliance on the United States that proved to be the undoing of this army. The interdependency forced on the Arvin by the U.S. mandated that the Arvin shape into a Western military. This caused huge strain on the economy and crafted a large resource-sucking army that was forced to rely on American aid. Further, it cultivated a power dependent on America's ordnance and artillery, thus losing its aggressive edge. After operating in this capacity for years, the Arvin watched its biggest ally and only hope fly away on Huey and Chinook helicopters in its hour of need. They carried the fight to the finish alone and suffered horrifically. In an immensely tragic 10-year span, an alliance of dysfunction was cultivated, it was tested, and it failed. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. All right, folks, uh, those are four great papers. We still got time for questions. Uh, first question, yes. Uh, if you don't mind, um, yeah. I am going to come around with these microphones. I'll ask for us to hear ourselves a more because uh, this conference is being videoed by First question from Professor Chris Erickson. 
Um, yeah, great papers, you guys. Um, my question is for Hannah and Holly. Um, so, you're <laughs> so both of you guys. Uh, so, you were talking about um, you know the counterculture and the deadheads, which are all kind of intertwined. Um, and you talked about some divisions um, within these kind of communities. I'm curious um, to what extent did men and women experience the counterculture differently? I mean, did, were you able to find any of that in your research? Um. So I'm primarily focused on primary sources, and from what I found, um, women who identified as hippies in the counterculture I've experienced it quite differently. There was a lot of um, prejudice against them, especially if they came forward like with uh, sexual assault claims to cops and everything, and they kind of dismiss them, well, you're in this free love environment, right? So. Um, Women definitely experience this counterculture vastly different, differently than men, but mostly due to outside forces that were judging them for being in such a counterculture. And I, I didn't really see a division between men and women within the counterculture. There certainly was some, but not to the extent of outside forces affecting that division between the two. Does that make sense? I hope so. Yeah, so perhaps women were more expected to conform to um Norms rather than men. Yeah, yeah. So, like, um, the men in the counterculture were encouraged um, more so to experience free love yes. and aren't uh, judged by the consequ consequences of that free love, such as, you know, STDs and whatnot. Whereas women um, bore the brunt of those judgments and the consequences as well. Um, if you look, I looked specifically also at police records um, in Haight-Ashbury during the time, and there was multitudes of uh, rapes, murders. I mean, it was uh, crime heavy as well. It wasn't just free love and make peace. There was also a very, there was a lot of crime as well happening during the time. Too. Dirty Harry films came out right after that in San Francisco, right? The Dirty Harry movement. Um, yeah, I didn't really uh, come across that very much in my research, but I think Holly summed it up pretty well. <laughs> all, right, all right, questions? Um, yes, and then yes. First of all, Josh. Okay, so I agree with Professor Erickson that these were all good papers. And in fact, it could also be seen as like a, a panel on the Pacific Rim in many ways, because you got San Francisco, China, <laughs> Vietnam. <laughs> But um, I was especially interested in the, the East Asia and Southeast Asia papers. Um, so for, um, for, for, for first for AMRA, I guess. Um, so uh, did you find any evidence of, I know you talked about it a little bit, of like Taiwan being extremely upset about what's going on with the, the uh, uh, better relations between uh, mainland China and the US? Um, and then for, for Sam, um, did you see any evidence of anything about, uh, well, China during when you were researching and their involvement? Because uh, I know they, they helped a lot in, with, uh, with North Vietnam. And then, of course, um, then after uh, North Vietnam took over all of Vietnam, there was kind of the falling out. And then China invaded <laughs> Vietnam in 1979. So those are my questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. And Taiwan is one of the countries that I actually didn't look into that much to see what the impact was on them. Um, and well, in, in that way, also, it wasn't just mentioned a lot in the sources I use, which I think has to do with the fact that the United States refused to recognize China over Taiwan. So it didn't make any concrete decisions um, that would have negatively affected Taiwan. That didn't come until 79. Um, uh, but there were there were other countries that definitely felt more of an impact, like Japan was one of them, because Japan's policy was a little bit confusing um, before ping pong diplomacy. And then after that happened, it completely, I mean, almost switched and it immediately recognized China following ping pong diplomacy. And like I said, they tried to pursue the same kind of diplomatic relations. And another one that was that was actually pretty negatively affected was Pakistan, because they used Pakistani channels when they were traveling. and that. That misled um, Pakistan to believe that the U.S. would be more supportive of them in their conflict with India. So they they were a little bit misled in that. But Taiwan, I didn't actually 
um, look into a lot. First off, I want to say that's a good question, but uh, China was like effectively able to play North Vietnam a bit of, like a bit like a fiddle. Okay, so North Vietnam kind of was in this weird situation at first, and um, China was first able to help them by saying, "Hey, we're not going to invade if you like kind of pressure south." Second thing they did, and they were able to deny this because they were like, "Well, we never sent combat troops." What they did was they sent a ton of support units to North Vietnam, and they trained, much like you know, U.S. advisors train South Vietnam. So they trained them. Um, China was a lot more of a Western structured military, um, and the U.S. had actually helped China build up their military. Um, so yeah, that's kind of funny. Um, so they were able to train them in tactics, uh, give them a ton of material, um, and I, I know they helped build the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They helped with a lot of bridges, um, things like that. And they were also, you know, like. North Vietnam wasn't in this kind of two-front war situation. Um, afterwards, that's your second question, was what happened afterwards. Um, Vietnam tragedy did not end once the U.S. left. Um, they were invaded by the Khmer as well, um, from Cambodia, I believe. Um, and that was just horrific. Um, and then afterwards, yeah, China. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not, it was not a good place for a very long time. But, uh, yeah, so China did kind of, I guess, fulfill its aims. So. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask, um, Holly, is it, right? Oh, hi. Yeah, hi. Um, <laughs> the, the, you cited Russell Baker's article, which I'm, I'm, I've read, and from, I love Russell Baker. I've read almost everything he's written. Did, did it, I just want your opinion. Did you think that that article was more satirical toward middle-class America or satirical toward the hippie movement? Oh, that's a good one. Nice. Hang on. <laughs> Let me. A good scholar refers to her notes. Yes. Um, so I initially, like uh, Bauer said, we did have to kind of condense our paper. Originally, what my paper was um, describing and entertaining the different perceptions of hippies. So I focused primarily on the Bay Area citizens and the journalists at the time as well. Um, so in that section I was um, honing in on how um, hippies sort of were defined as these enticing new creatures that they're so different and they're not human they're you know they're enticing they're kind of sexy they're different right um, so I was honing in on how they're kind of viewed as a spectacle and thus um, because of how they're viewed they're they're inherently, their aims are not inherently um, grounded in reality almost because they themselves are not grounded in reality. Um, but I think, I think Baker, it might have been a little bit of both. Um, I think he was more hypocritical of the hippie experiment itself versus middle class America. Um, he made a point, where was it? So many papers. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think he was kind of making fun of almost, well, I guess not making fun of, that's a bad choice of words. Um, kind of satirizing, is that a word? <laughs> right, being satirical toward uh, hippies, but. Um, you know, he makes mention of, you know, do not receive fresh replacements and um, a nation's need for alarming situation reports. At that point, it could be towards middle class America as well. Um, but I, f I felt like his, his viewpoint was more satirical towards the hippie movement as a whole versus immediate aims to alarm citizens. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. All right. Just to say that as an old hippie and a dead dad, dad, <laughs> we are grounded in reality. Right. Except the reality from everybody else. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody, let's give a big hand for the first panel today.